Welcome. Hey. Hello. Hello, hello. Well, today is one of my favorite days. May 2nd? No, ask a theologian. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Mine too. One of yeah. my favorite days to see see uh, you. Let's just knock it out of the park. Hey, I'm happy to, happy to serve. But before we get into that, I think we have Over. to say happy birthday. Yeah, we have a big list today. We yeah. have Rodney. We have Papa Stairlord. We have Christine and Jimmy Lee, two Tarians. Wow, that's amazing. And Jenna and Meredith and three special friends of mine, Terry, Kim, and Christine, who are watching, and myself. Your birthday too? Even I age. No way. I, I thought you went backwards or something. <laughs> I'm trying. But maybe we should sing happy birthday let's to all it. of these let's people. Let's, and let's, okay let's do it loud and, and singing over each other so it's terrible to listen. Okay. I'm right. going to lean in. Here we yeah. go. And dun 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 dum. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to everyone we mentioned. Happy birthday to you. I hope we were in sync in our harmony. <laughs> We were in sync in our hearts. We were in sync in our hearts. <laughs> For sure. Um, everyone, uh, looking forward to your birthday this month. Oh, Maximilian and Chris Christian's birthday wow. on the 22nd. So some Geminis. Yeah. So stick big, around. Big birthday month. For sure. Yeah. So fun. Well, uh, one of my favorite favorite days, I, I'm sad that I can't be here with my, my pal uh, okay. and... Um, um, but Martha, crime, Martha Lee. Yes, with my pal Martha. Um, but I'm happy to hold down the fort. And if you're watching, please type in your questions. Uh, you know, you won't be disappointed for sure. So type in your questions. But but I'll get us started. Um, one one question is: I loved your sermon today. Um, uh, uh, the topic of being on the the margins. Um, and but when you when you think of what you spoke about today, do you find ways that you relate it to today's time? Yeah, for sure. I'm, I mean, I think you know there are uh, there are lots of groups in the church. For one, that you know. I wonder if you know is this sort of Christian is this sort of church a Christian church or is this sort of church a Christian church? But what uh, what the Bible seems to teach us is that um, if you if you are, have responded to God's call, if 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 you have sort of heard, heard the voice of the gospel, then you're you're a follower in the way of Jesus. And uh, the, the kinds of things that divide churches, I, I I think that that's not that's not helpful. Nor is it you know God's plan, such as it is for what God wants. Uh, God's uh, God's church to be like, mm -hmm. and I also think that you know there is um, you know some of my um, my uh, theologians who, who are who do queer theology see Philip the Evangelist as uh, the kind of patron saint of allyship, and mm -hmm. uh, and that for them um, the eunuch represents a kind of prototype of of a black trans life. And that, uh, and that this this could be a metaphor for God's love of Black trans people, uh, which um, which many theologians have used uh, as a, as a, a starting point for contemporary reflection on what it means to be an affirming and inclusive church. Wow, I'm so glad I asked that question, not just for my own pride, but for your answer and your response. Uh, gosh, you hit it right on the the head. As far as something I I believe are trans community and our trans friends, uh, particularly the black and brown trans community, definitely could use the, the, the allyship and the support and, and the spotlight. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, here's a question uh, from Christine Lee. Uh, does God steal, does God still heal today? Mm. Given the emphasis on miraculous healing in Jesus's ministry in the Gospels, what should we make of this? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think all of us have experienced times where we've uh, asked God for a healing for ourselves or someone that we love, and the 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 sickness doesn't go away, and and sometimes the person might even die. 
And it can really call into question that. And it seems particularly difficult when we read in the Bible that so much of Jesus's ministry was a healing ministry. And, um, you know, there are some scholars that try to downplay that, well, maybe it was more of like an emotional healing or the healing was sort of metaphorical. But when you think about the kinds of crowds that were attracted to Jesus, the kinds of notoriety that Jesus developed over a very short period of time of public ministry, it seems unlikely to me that Jesus would have been known as a healer had he not actually been successful in healing, had God not actually accomplished healings for people through Jesus. And, and healing in the Bible is, um, is often more than just the physical or biological healing that we think about today when we think about modern medicine. It was a much more holistic sense of self. So to, for someone to be to be sick or to be broken uh, implied that there was a kind of distancing from society. So there was a social de de uh, de dimension to it, a kind of, and so healing really means this kind of full restoration of a person kind of in their, their body, their soul, their community context, the whole, the whole sort of uh, range of what it means to, to be a human being. Um, so the question then is, does God continue to heal today? And I think that if we believe that God was, was able to heal through Jesus, and we believe the stories of scripture that early Christians continued in a healing ministry, then there's no reason to not think that God uh, doesn't continue to heal today. And I think uh, at, in, the same, in the same time that we have you know, moments in our life where divine healing doesn't seem to come, I think that we can clearly attribute God's healing activity to um, everything from kind of uh, miraculous healings that might occur within our, our, our world today, all the way and in including modern medicine, which is, I think, a, an extension of God's kind of healing arts through the, the mechanism of modern science and research. But then the question arises, well, what do we do about the times when God doesn't heal? And there are, uh, there are two sorts of answers that you can, you can come to. You know, one that, uh, that may be helpful kind of after the fact, and one uh, that may be sort of helpful in, in the midst of, of, of sickness or grief or suffering. And in the midst of sickness, grief, or suffering, I, I, I like to remember that um, God, God is still with me, even though I may not, uh, may, may not be healed. And I don't know why I'm sick. Uh, but I know that sickness and brokenness and, and the death of my body is part of the natural state of being a human being, and that I, I believe that God will eventually restore my body, even if it means that uh, it may have to be uh, in, in the next life. And that's what leads us to the second thing, which may or may not be pastorally helpful in the midst of suffering, but um, it is that that when the, the, the promise of, of God is that in the end, uh, all things will be made right. All things will be made well, uh, to, to quote uh, T.S. Eliot, who's as good of a sacred poet as anyone, um, that all, all shall be made well. And that, uh, that, that there always will be a, a, an answered, a positively answered prayer for healing, even if it's not in this life. Well said. Oh my gosh. Um... So there's a, a question that I asked of Deacon Denise last week, and I'm going to ask it for you um, because you sort of spoke to a question that I formed in my head. Like, how do you speak to those who sort of lose their faith when they're in the healing process and are just sort of like in question about their faith? But I'll broaden the question to say, like, if someone were to, you know, question their ability or the power of prayer, um, what would you say to that person or would you teach them a special prayer or would you teach them how to pray but someone who has like a distant relationship with prayer what yeah. what what would you what would you say to them well you know i think you know when it comes to uh our relationship with with god um you know we we tend to treat prayer or there there is a tendency to treat prayer as either and i've used this metaphor before as a, like a slot machine or a vending machine and if, it's a slot <laughs> machine, you know, if i pull down the handle maybe i'm going to get all sevens maybe i'm going to get like a lemon and a cherry and a club uh, i just don't know what i'm going to get and no, then, whammies. <laughs> no whammies no whammies no whammies <laughs> big money big money big money no whammies <laughs> and, 
and you know that that kind of that's how sometimes it feels when we pray because we don't sort of we don't understand the the, the mind of God or how how all of this kind of plays out. Um, but I think that that view of God makes God really kind of uh, capricious and a little kind of more like like Loki in sort of Norse mythology mm. than like the God that we see in the Bible, who is 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 less capricious and more invested in the life of people. And the other model is to just treat prayer like a vending machine, like there's some sort of direct correlation between between my goodness or my holiness. And, you know, if I put in enough coins, I'm going to get the, the Snickers bar that <laughs> the Snickers bar that I deserve. But I think that view takes a really um, kind of has a bad uh, 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 fra frames, you know, what it, what it means to be in relationship with God kind of poorly because it says, well, what, what matters isn't so much God's grace, but my, my worth. And, uh, and one of the things that we see in scripture is that um, you know, God's, uh, God's love for us, God's care for us isn't contingent on our worth. I mean, we've been in our um, Genesis Bible study on Thursday nights at 7.30 on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> email rsvp at stpeterschelsea.org to, to join. Um, we've been walking through Genesis and particularly the, the story of Abraham. And Abraham is like a super conflicted dude. He is a, he, he does some terribly shady stuff in, 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 his, in his life. And still God loves him and God is faithful to him and faithful to his offspring. And I think the example in the story of Abraham is that it's not really about what I bring to the table as much as it is what God brings to the table. And I say all of this as a way of kind of getting around to the point of prayer and faith in general. The faith isn't about what I can do or what I bring to the table. It isn't about some kind of like cosmic, you know, uh, mischievous deity who may or may not reward me. It's really about engaging in a relationship of trust and uh, trust in God, that God is the kind of being who is, uh, who has demonstrated God's faithfulness to God's creation, who sustains us, who cares for us, who loves us, even in times that are tough. God doesn't prevent the tough times. Doesn't, God doesn't prohibit us from having tough times, but God promises to be with us in the midst of tough times. And so that, that's how I tend to frame uh, questions of prayer and faith and, and acknowledging that it's a journey, that there are going to be like any relationships. Um, there are times when it's going to be really hard to, to trust in God and God's going to feel really distant and not as near as we would like. But that doesn't mean that God isn't with us, even though we may not be able to feel that comfort of God's presence. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm checking our chat to see if there's a, a question. Um, if you have a question for Michael, just type it in. Um, but uh, for the moment, um, I'm going to ask that you expound on one word that you just used in your description. And that word is grace. Yeah. Um, and I think um, uh, I, it, it's sort of mystic because this past week, the concept of grace, like, was kind of thrown in my face and had me questioning like, what is it with grace? It's a, it's a way that I sign my emails mostly like uh, with grace and peace is what I say as far as like a, a, a signed off, sign off. But this week I started to think, what, what does that mean? What does grace mean? Yeah. Um, well, um, you know, grace has as, as its, its root concept, the idea of gift. And so, Grace is this, this kind of free gift that you receive from God of God's favor, of God's presence, of God's promise, and God's love. And it's given to you not because you're deserving of it, but because God loves you. And, you know, it's hard for us sometimes to wrap our head around what a true gift really, really is. Because, um, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, when it's time for a holiday or for my birthday, I like to drop a lot of hints. Like, you know, <laughs> This is the thing that I want. And I'm notorious for this one really, really bad practice, which is um, if there's a present that I want for Christmas that I know Julia won't buy for me, I will buy it for myself, wrap it, and give it to myself on Christmas Aww. morning. So, like years ago, I really wanted an Xbox. You know, I was like, hey, I'm an adult. I have a job. I want, I want to kill zombies at 10 o'clock at night when the kids are in bed. And uh, Julia doesn't want to have any of that. She thinks it's a waste of time and money, which is totally right. It absolutely is. And it's probably not a good thing for me to be doing. And also, I really, really wanted it and loved it. So uh, for that Christmas, I um, 
went on to Amazon and of course other online retailers are available. And I purchased this, um, I purchased an Xbox, gave it to myself. And I did something like that for a couple of years at Christmas, so much so that I'm sort of notorious for this in our in <laughs> So that that's a, but that's not a gift because you know it wasn't uh, it wasn't given to me freely. It wasn't something that I didn't even ask for. It was uh, it was it was sort of my own kind of thing. And sometimes also we think you know gifts are like uh, in exchange for something that you do or some 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 kind of characteristic that you have. But when it comes to the gift of grace in the Bible, it really is kind of God's free, unmerited uh, favor and love to God's God's people and God's creation. And um, and that's that's really really powerful. I mean, I think that one of the one of the dangers that a lot of us have, or certainly that I had, um, you know, sort of when I think about my kind of kind of the the sort of baseline theology that I I default to, is the sense that I really need to please God, that I need to do something to make sure that I'm worthy of God. And you know, I think so many of us feel that way about you know about faith, about religion. Maybe it has to do with the way that, you know, our sort of our families of origin or the churches of origin that we were initially shaped by. But a strong theology of grace says there's nothing that you can do to make God uh, love you less. And there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. God's love for you is maxed out at all times. And that's why God is so crazy about um, reaching out and caring for and, and, uh, and, and seeking God's creation. That's why we find God especially in the stories of the New Testament, out in the midst of the world, in, in the marge where, where we think the margins exist, that's where God's the center of God's love is found. Mm -hmm. God's grace is so powerful uh, in seeking us out in relation to God. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, here's one for you. Batter up. Um, uh, there's no basketball sort of like terms that relate to batter up is again there? i wouldn't know because i'm so <laughs> unsporting i like totally i like shared my secret shame today like i can't catch i you know yeah when you spoke about it i felt the vulnerability that you were sharing and i and i hold it in my hand my, my chubby my chubby fifth grade self was like was finally seen for who they were <laughs> i felt it and and i loved it loved your sharing um this is from alice any wisdom encouragement theological guidance for recent racial hate crimes and killings wow i mean that is that is that is that is tough that is tough stuff i think you know we can be sure that god is absolutely not on the side of this racially motivated hate and violence uh, that this is this is misguided. Uh, if there's anything that we see, again, the, the example of the Ethiopian eunuch is one, but you know the Book of Acts is full of examples of uh, of, of God's love bridging the gap between divides, uh, most of which, many of which, were sort of religious, social, cultural, and economic divides. So while the contemporary understanding of race. Uh, maybe more of a, of a social construct that were that that didn't exist exactly the same kind of way in the ancient world. There still were were ways in which people uh, so were, were filtered into this or that camp, the insider and the outsider. Um, uh, and the first ten chapters of Acts uh, engage in several key moments where these, these barriers were were broken down by 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 great love. Whether it was Peter, who was uh, a, uh, you know, a uh, who had kept kosher his whole life and lived the life of a, a devout Jew, was called by God to, uh, to to baptize and preach the gospel to Greek centurions. So not only you know going from you know uh, from a Jewish to a pagan context and a Jewish to a Gentile context, but from uh, the 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 occupied to the occupying, the kind of dominant force and crossing in that direction as well. I mean these kinds of transgressions mark the work of the gospel. And so when I think about our current context, I think we, we can stand firm knowing that this is not God's will and God's desire, that we, um, we are called to be peacemakers and to be involved in God's act of, of reconciliation. So I, I think that I, I feel hope in knowing that, um, that the, the, the direction that God 
uh, is, I believe, leading us toward is one of re reconciliation and healing across these divides, mm -hmm. and that our particular call are, is to be agents of that reconciliation in the world. Oh, what a hopeful response. Your, your terminology, your, your, when you say that, you know, these trans transgressions sort of demark like the journey of the gospel and that really gives this time some hope that, you know, from great things come from great struggles. So here we are in this kind of struggle. Gosh, that's a very helpful response. Good question, Alice. Um, it looks like I'm checking to see. There's not a question here, um, but then I'll give you a chance to make a, how do I say, a summation or, or, or final thought. Is there any, um, what aspect of today's sermon would you like to sort of like highlight a, a, just, a, just a little bit more or expound on? What aspect of that? Yeah, I mean, I drive think, it home. <laughs> you know, when I was doing research for the sermon, I, I got kind of lost in the in the history of Ethiopian Christianity, which is this really like very um, just fascinating kind of set of stories. And, and you know, we don't really know uh, we don't know much about the actual history of, of Ethiopian Christianity, but there's a a very uh, plausible legend that says that um, the Queen of Sheba visited King Solomon in like the nine or eight hundreds uh, BC and uh, that she uh, became uh, pregnant with Solomon's uh, Solomon's son and an heir and came back to Ethiopia and that there had been this link between Ethiopia and uh, and and Israel that it was established in ancient days and that uh, then years later when Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians in the sixth century BC a small group of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Jews from Judah uh, sought shelter and refuge in, in Ethiopia. Uh, and so there had always been, so the story goes, some kind of devout Jewish community in Ethiopia. Uh, it wasn't the, the kind of official religion of Ethiopia, but it had this like long standing um, kind of link there. And so um, when, uh, when Ethiopian Orthodox Christians talk about their, their, their nations, their kingdoms experience with Christianity. They say, well, we were, we, we have a, a foundation of Judaism for a thousand years. And for 2000 years, the preaching of this Ethiopian eunuch, we have this, this great Christian heritage. Uh, and some 40 million uh, Ethiopians are Orthodox Christians today. Now it hasn't always been a great history. It's not, it's been brought with a lot of sort of complicity with power and uh, violence and, and as the church always is in, in their periods of its history. But I think it's just really fascinating that this one person who would have been a, 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 uh, a human spoil of some ancient conflict, uh, who was numbered and castrated, and mm -hmm. forced into the service of a royal house, becomes this, this foundation for a, a massive two, cent, two, two millennia old uh, church in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think that's just that's, that's that's the kind of God that we serve, God who makes things that people are willing to disregard and talk off. But no, this is the center of my my work in the world, uh, and that that's that's what gives me hope for the gospel. Wow, oh my gosh, I could have sworn that you were making a pitch for an epic film. Oh my gosh, yes, the Queen of Sheba and Queen King of Sheba. Solomon, <laughs> right, and all of that falling out and what makes it so epic is that the story continues into modern times and we see this the, the fall of it fall out of it that would be an amazing story to story to see yeah. um i'm not gonna let you go just yet because a last minute question came okay. in okay so um and it's a pretty good one uh one that you started to expound on so from michelle howard um, could you shed any light on how to understand the massacres in the Old Testament, Old Testament of various people's groups? To put it in context, they are very disturbing to me. Yeah, they're totally disturbing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, there are a couple of ways around this, uh, or not around this, there are a couple of ways that people interpret these kinds of things. And, you know, the, the, a good example of this is like the, the conquest of Canaan, right? So the journey into the promised land 
ends with the Israelites crossing the River Jordan and then committing horrendous genocide with, to, uh, against almost all the inhabitants. Uh, and that's, that's the story that they told of their conquest here. Unabashedly, um, really un unreflectively, um, it, you know, it, 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 in, uh, and, and in ways that continued for hundreds of years to, to um, outright slander the indigenous peoples of Palestine and Canaan. Again, on our amazing Thursday night Bible study at 7.30 on Zoom, uh, we, were, um, we were reading a passage in Genesis that talks about the origins of the, of the Moabites and the Anamites. And these are two native tribes, the, the Canaan, the land conquered by uh, the Israelites. That's the, the story of their national origin that they would tell. And they were, it was like this really gross, incestuous story, like, hey, Moabites and Anamites, they're all the descendants of this, like, this, in, this terrible incest story. Uh, as a way of saying, you know, th these people are backwards and, uh, and um, you know, and should be easily dismissed. So, so we've got conquest, we've got um, intertribal uh, conflict, we've got all kinds of terrible things going on in the Bible. So the question is, does the presence of these things, these terrible, terrible stories that are terrible, terrible things, does that mean that God is cool with that and that God is sort of a, you know, whatever the means is, if the end that I'm looking for, I'm going to do that? Or are these, uh, is the Bible a very, very human story that includes in it things that are really terrible and God isn't so happy about, as well as things that God loves and is really happy about? And I think it's the second one, because I think that um, the Bible doesn't um, doesn't bleach over or whitewash the propensity of humans to be sinful. Uh, it acknowledges that we are broken and sinful. And I think it even opens up a space that there are places in the Bible where people think that God is calling them to do things or that they think that they're doing something in the name of God. And it turns out that they may have actually been really wrong in that. Uh, and I think we have to judge that against the character of God as, as God describes God's self in the Bible. And yes, God describes God's self as, as vengeful um, uh, and as, as a jealous God. But this, the, and we see plenty of examples of people interpreting God's actions in terms of smiting and, 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 and whatnot. But I think the overall character of God that we see in scripture, when we look at the whole thing together, is this loving God who is reaching out to God's creation to bring it together and to bring it closer into God's self. And so I think if that becomes the hermeneutic, if that becomes the key or the lens through which we read scripture, particularly through the lens of the, the Jesus Christ story and, and how as Christians, we, we read the scriptures through Jesus, we can begin to see that there are these, these examples of conquest and genocide and, and, and terrible, terrible things in scripture where terrible things are done in the name of God, but that may, just because the humans are doing things in the name of God, doesn't mean it's actually consistent with God's will or character. So that's well, how I feel about that one, Michelle. Yes, I'm satisfied with that with that answer. Um, I hope you are too. I dare say we are coming to yep. the end of this session, but here's a quick one for you. Which language do you think the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the scroll in? Was it that's Hebrew? A really good one. So he was reading it, we think, in Greek because the the, se the section that uh, Luke um, uh, was quoting from was from the, the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, which would have been the most common version of the, um, of the Old Testament written by God-fearers or Gentile Jews. Um, he may not have had access to Hebrew, uh, Hebrew instruction, especially as somebody who was a eunuch and wouldn't have been part of the synagogue system. So if he was going to learn the prayers and scriptures and stories of ancient Israel, he would have likely have done so through the Septuagint. God bless you, Michael. God yeah. bless your teachers. Yeah, thank God you. bless your study buddies in <laughs> seminary and school because they served you well. Um, I appreciate you so much. I admire you and look up to you. Thank you for this session. Um, and I'm looking forward to next month already. <laughs> all right, we'll see you all. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> ole, ole.